Hello, and welcome to worship at Faith Mennonite Church. I'm Pastor Marshall Anderson. We're so glad that you're with us. Today is Sunday, September 27th, and we are going to have this space of worship, but we're also going to be gathering in person today outside on our yard while the weather is still beautiful. And so if you've been joining us for sermon discussion, that's not going to be taking place today, but we do want to offer this space of worship. So thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. The Call to Worship is written by Marlene Croft. Come, people of God, and worship Jesus Christ. Once we were separated from him, aliens and strangers who did not belong, without hope and without God in the world. Once we loved darkness rather than light, but once we could not sing the Lord's song. But now we are joined with Christ, brought near through his blood, for Jesus is our peace. Now we who lived in darkness have come into the light. Now we who could not sing have been given a new song. Let us give thanks to God. Let us worship Jesus Christ. Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another Should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. All my death but for death beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I won't bow to the things of this world I know Great. 
and his reckoning. I know I will never be alone. I know I will never be alone. To be another in the fire, standing next to me. To be another in the water, holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminding? How could you be to me? Joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. And I can see the light in the darkness, and the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar of the heavens as the space between where sin. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls came in. I invite you to join me in prayer today. Gracious and loving God, draw close to us in this space. We have been called by your name. We have experienced your kindness and your mercy to us. We seek to follow you. And yet so often we struggle to do that the way that you have invited us and called us to. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. It is so easy for us, O oh Lord, to be consumed by everything that happens around us. As we continue to navigate this pandemic, as the West Coast continues to deal with wildfires, as our southern states continue to deal with tropical storms and hurricanes, as there is so much tension around us all the time, as we're approaching an election season and our phones, our computers, our television screens are occupied with political ads that so often are negative and attacking, it's easy for us, O oh God, to be consumed by all that's going on around us, for us to be overwhelmed. Center us, O oh God, in the loving embrace of your presence. Remind us that you are with us, that you love us, that we have everything that we need because of who you are. Help us, O oh God, to live from that place, not as persons who are filled with anxiety, but people who are overcome with hope and promise and joy. Joy that goes deeper than simply getting our way, but joy that comes from who you are and the way that you love us. God, as we confess our brokenness before you, heal and restore us. Direct our steps so that we can walk faithfully with you. God, we give you thanks for the amazing ways that you love us. Watch over and guide us. Help us to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised, by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, 
who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Hi, everybody. I don't want to go very long today, uh, but I do want to pull out something that I think is really, really significant for us in this reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. And that is who the focus of the antagonist is for Paul. I think this has a lot to say to us. So this reading, if you're unfamiliar, is really an anthem for people who see Jesus as the peacemaker. Uh, Christ is our peace. And this beautiful thing about how Jesus makes peace is just woven throughout this section of text. And it's beautiful. It really starts out with this call that everyone is included, this radical inclusive message, where at one time, because of tradition and because of rules and because of expectations, it was just this group of people and this other group, you were considered not quite good enough, but because of what Jesus has done, that dividing wall has been destroyed and the two have become one. And there's this beautiful harmony. Now, one of the challenges of this text is that that harmony isn't really fulfilled yet, is it? I mean, it's started, but we haven't really lived into the fullness of this invitation for being one body. Uh, sometimes we struggle to be uh, a church. Our churches struggle to find unity. Our communities struggle to find unity. Our country finds difficulty in unity. Our world certainly has difficulty finding unity. And so as opposed to seeing this work as fully completed, the thing that I want to pull out and focus our attention on today is what Jesus accomplishes. Because what Paul says is that the victory of Jesus, the peace of Christ that comes, is that Jesus spoke peace to those who were far off, who were separated, and to those who were near. So to both those who grew up in this tradition of faith, of following God, and to those who had no idea, to those who have the right last name and to those who don't, to those who are locals and to those who are outsiders, everybody, Jesus preaches this message of peace. And it's peace with God. And that is a significant thing because what Jesus puts to death, as Paul says, as Jesus is being killed, Jesus is killing enmity or hostility. Now that may seem kind of strange. How was Jesus putting to death hostility? And how is it that hostility is the enemy? It seems like it would almost be better if Jesus said that these people were right and these people were wrong, or here's the exact formula you need to follow. But as it turns out, the formula Jesus is pointing us to is unity, and unity is not found in uniformity. It's not that everybody sees things the exact same way. It's not that everybody agrees. It's that everyone has been united by something bigger than ourselves. And one of the things that creates more hostility in this world than anything else is the anger and the aggression against others with whom we disagree. And we make what issue, whatever issues we disagree about incredibly important. So much so that we will sacrifice other things that are actually perhaps more important to us. What Paul is saying is that Jesus has made peace with everyone. Everyone is embraced by God and invited to respond to that. Now this is radical language. Because up until this point, you really needed to earn God's love. But God is the one who's actually saying, you already have my love. Just live into it. 
Stop trying to earn it. Stop trying to achieve it. Receive this grace and this love and this peace and live from this place. So what does this have to say to us today? Well, a lot, I think. Number one, it has something to say about what we get angry about because we get angry about many things. And it raises a question about whether or not everything we get so passionate about is worth that energy. It also raises the question of whether or not we have really acknowledged how loved we are by God and if we've allowed that to be the most important thing. Because when we make other things more important, <clears throat> we really diminish what the grace is and what it means for us. This word of Paul that the antagonist in this story is our hostility should be a wake-up call for you and for me. If you've ever been with somebody who was on their deathbed, who maybe knew that the end was near, have you ever talked to them about what they cared about? Were they stirred up about the same things they'd been stirred up about before? Were they angry about what the election might do? Were they upset about this policy or that policy? Or were they focused on different things? Were they more interested in having a conversation with their loved ones? Were they more interested in seeing their kids or their grandkids one more time? Like, what was it that consumed them? Was it everything they were against or was it everything that brought them joy? And why is it, if we're not facing the end in an imminent kind of way, do we take for granted all of that and instead put our energy in all that we oppose? As it turns out, Paul says, the actual antagonist, the actual thing working against our, our true connection with God, a right relationship, is the hostility that we carry towards things, towards people, towards everything around us. We get so hostile. And Jesus puts that hostility to death on the cross by preaching peace to those who are far off and those who are near, bringing unity, creating one body. So the invitation for us to live into that is to explore what have we made so important? What do we get really angry about? And is that worth our energy? Because it is worth standing up for justice. It is worth standing up for things that matter. But if we can't acknowledge first and foremost that we are loved and so is the person we're upset with, we're gonna really struggle to step into this kingdom of God the way we've been invited to. We're gonna find it very difficult to be one body. So may you find the grace that God has given you and extend it to others. May you find in others the same love of Jesus that you have experienced. May you see in the other something that God embraces and is willing to lay down his life for. May you embrace the peace of Christ. Amen.
Thank you for joining us today. Uh, no matter what is happening in your life, we want you to know that you are beloved of God and there is a community that you already belong to. We are glad that you've chosen to be with us today and if there's any way we can walk alongside of you, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, give us a call, send us an email. We would love to hear from you. In the meantime, know that you are never alone. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. The Lord will quiet you with his love. The Lord will rejoice over you with singing. May grace and peace be with you. Amen.